feed on your flaws. They drain your time. And they never leave you alone. Hey, I need to run a few errands. Can you watch my dog? Again? So we're in a series called Relational Vampires, and uh, we just know that vampires suck the blood out of you, right? And uh, sometimes there are people in our life that tend to suck the life out of us. And so we're trying to figure out how do we love those people that tend to suck the life out of us. Last week we talked about controlling people and how when we know what our calling is in Christ... There is clarity in our life, and we don't necessarily have to worry about getting pulled away from what our calling is by people trying to control us because we know who's in control, and that's Jesus. Amen? Amen. And next week, we're going to be talking about needy people, just those people that it doesn't matter how much you do, how much you give, how much you're there for them. It's just never enough, right? And then the week after that, we're going to be talking about hypocritical people, those people that say that they're Christians, that um, you necessarily, they don't necessarily do what they say they believe, right? Maybe you see some things going on in their life that, you, you know, you're like, well, wait a second, I thought you said, right? And so what's our role in that? Do we even have a role in that? What are we to do when we see that um, kind of thing going on? So we're, that's what we're going to talk about in a couple weeks. But this morning... We're talking about critical people. And so, unfortunately, this is something that all of us will deal with. All of us are going to face critical people in our life, right? Um, how many of you have someone in your life that um, is their spiritual gift is fault finding? Any of you? I know that I do. Um, listen, if you leaned over to the person next to you and have already told them the three things you don't like about this church, this might be you, okay? <laughs> so, critical people, right? And so, um, and it just comes in all different forms. You might have a boss, right, that micromanages, that really you don't hear any input from them, that you never hear anything unless you've done something wrong and you're in trouble. Right? It doesn't matter how good you do, how hard you work. You just never really get any feedback until you've messed up. And then all of a sudden, there's all this feedback. They're just critical. Maybe you, you are an adult with a parent who's critical. You know, they kind of, they're always on you about, you know, how to raise your kids, how to spend your money. Um, you know, why do you go to that weird Meadowcrest church that, you, you know, they're a cell church. What is that? I don't even know what that is. You know, I mean, I don't know. You, you might have those people. Uh, or it could be a spouse. You're struggling in your marriage. Um, you know, you might have somebody that criticizes how you chew your food or how you load the dishwasher or how you leave your clothes on the floor. Or how you wear the same pants day after day. I'm just spitballing here. <laughs> Not that I know or understand or have heard any of these things. <laughs> really, you're wearing those pants again today? Yeah, because they fit. Okay, all right. So there are those critical people in our life. And so, listen, here. The church is an easy target for critical people. There are critical people outside the church. There are critical people inside the church. And the church itself is an easy target. Right? Well, well, they don't preach enough about whatever. Or they're constantly preaching about whatever. The worship is to this or to that. Right? Um, it, it's always something. You know, the, the service is too long. It's too loud. You know, the pastor's way too cool to be a pastor. You, you know, I mean, I don't know what it could be. But there's always critical people. Aristotle said, to avoid criticism, do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. Right? Now, I don't want to criticize Aristotle. But I'm pretty sure if you do nothing and say nothing, someone's going to criticize you for being a lazy bum. Yeah. Right? So, not that I'm being critical or anything. 
Um, listen, when you follow Jesus, you will be criticized. You're going to be criticized from people outside the church that don't follow Jesus. And sometimes, unfortunately, you're going to be criticized by people that do follow Jesus. And so the fact that we will be criticized... I mean, I just love to kind of criticize about that phone, but that's okay. I won't. <laughs> how do we respond, right? I mean, that's how to... Because we all have to deal with that. And sometimes it can suck the life out of you. And, and I mean, you can... There can be big things going on in your life, and when someone criticizes it, it just takes all the joy out of it at times, right? And so we all deal with that. So how do we deal with criticism? How do we deal with critical people? So if you'll open up your apps or pull out your main focus, got some fill in the blanks there. Um, I think there are four things that we need to kind of pull from the scriptures this morning to just look at how to deal with critical people. The first one is often you don't respond. <laughs> Right, Just because someone criticizes you, it doesn't obligate you to respond. Right, You don't have to always respond to criticism, and a lot of times, just don't. Don't respond at all. In 1 Peter, he's writing about just Jesus. He's talking about um, the, the life of Jesus. So Peter's writing this in chapter 2, verse 23. He says, when he, talking about Jesus, was reviled, some translations would say criticized or attacked, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued what? Entrusting himself to him who judges rightly. Right? Jesus was called a friend of sinners, and that's not a compliment. He was called a drunkard. Right? He was called a heretic. He was called a lunatic. I mean, they, they, he was attacked nonstop, and often, well, most often, he didn't respond. Right? He, didn't, he didn't retaliate. He, he didn't have to defend because he trusted God. Right? He trusted himself to the one who judged justly. Right? That's the Father. So he didn't feel like he needed to respond. Listen, it goes back to when you know your calling, it clarifies. And so that someone may be criticizing you, but you know that's okay because... I know what I'm to be doing. I know my calling. I know I'm being obedient to what God would have me do. Right? And so criticism really doesn't matter. The writer of Proverbs uh, chapter 19, verse 11, it says, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Right? Overlooking offenses, listen to me, it's not pretending it didn't happen. Right? We're not just sticking our head in the sand and pretending these things don't happen. Uh, it, it, it is an attack. We need to acknowledge that, but that doesn't mean that we need to respond. Right? We overlook that. that it's a conscious decision to let it go. Yes. Right? That word technically, overlook, an offense, the, the word for overlook is the same word for Passover. Right? It means to, it, it's a form of forgiveness. It, it's not forgiving a past hurt, it's forgiving in real time. Right? We pass over that offense. Yes, they're coming at me, they're attacking me, but I'm going to look beyond that because I know my calling, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know the decisions that I've made are the ones that I need to be making because I know my calling. You, you follow me? So w we just let it go. We pass over. We, we forgive that offense, right? Um, here, let me, let me kind of just share some, the best way to do it. I want to share some personal stories. In the past, leading this church, Peggy and I have dealt with some incredible hurts. We've had some horrible accusations over the years. Um, we've had people leave the church and sling mud on the way out. Um, we've had people that have left the church continue to sling mud via Facebook or Twitter or um, just through other relationships. And so we've just had to deal with that hurt. And as from a leadership perspective, this is what I tell the direction team and the elders of the church. Most often, we're not going to respond. We're not going to get caught up. And listen, I would love to get in the big middle of it. Trust me, I can think of some great comebacks and some great, you know, gotchas. I'm pretty good at them. 
but really the best thing is to just not respond. You're not going to do any good by responding most often, right? You have to choose to rise above it. You just, here, you don't reply. Um, don't let something so low pull you from a higher calling, right? So, you just don't respond. Does that make sense? I mean, your role is to obey God, not to answer critics. So, we just oftentimes just don't respond. And listen, I know that's difficult. I get it. But I cannot tell you how many times um, that I've seen this to be true. But just averting disaster, averting a blow up, averting confrontation by just letting something go. Just don't respond. It's not going to do any good. Right? So oftentimes we don't respond, number one. Number two, sometimes you respond carefully. Now, not react, respond. There's a big difference. You hear me? Say amen. amen. Right? React is to hear it and go back at them. Responding it, it is to respond carefully. It is to, to explain or to give context. Does that make sense? So um, sometimes someone can kind of criticize you for something that you do, but, but they don't necessarily understand the context of why you did what you did or why you're going to do what you're going to do. Right? In Judges chapter 8, there's a guy by the name of Gideon. He is leading the people, and um, they had kind of partnered up with some other folks. And so uh, Gideon was, was taking care of something. If you read the whole thing, he's, he, he's, he's on a campaign, a military campaign, and there was something that he needed to do that God had kind of told him, listen, you're going to harvest these grapes and this and that. And so it, it's, it's a big, long story, but the gist of it is this. In, in verse 1 it says, Then the men of Ephraim said to him, talking to Gideon, what is this that you have done to us, not to call us when you went to fight against Midian? Right. So what what, what the Ephraims were going or Ephraimites they were going to help. They wanted to help because they wanted to be a part of this campaign to get rid of the Midianites. And, and so, but Gideon went out and did it on his own because God told him do this because you're going to be okay. I'm, I got you. Right. And so he did that. It says, and they accused him fiercely. Depending on the translation, some says they attacked him, they criticized him. They were like, why did you go out and do this? You said you were going to call us, but you didn't call us, bro. What's up with that? Right? You ever had someone do that to you? And then it says, and he said to them, and then his response was why he did what he did. Right? That God had it all planned out. You're good. Right? You got these things. We got these things. We did it. I took care of it because that's what I was supposed to do. And then in verse 3 it says, Then their anger against him subsided when he had said this. Right? He explained the context. So they were criticizing him by what he was doing. They criticized him sharply. But then once he gave the context of why he did what he did, they were like, Oh, okay, I got you. All right, thanks, man. Right? You ever had that happen to you? Right? Someone criticized you, but then you kind of back up and you give them the context of what was going on and, and kind of give them a little bit better insight. And, and, and then that helps. Right? Uh, again, to share a story, um, we had dealt with some, some, some drama go on. Um, there was some sin within some people, and, and so I had addressed that sin. Uh, I, what I had thought on a very loving uh, position sat down with these folks and said, you know, let's, there is this sin. We know, I know about it. Um, it was brought to my attention. L let's, let's make some moves. Let's do some things, give you a season to repent, and then we'll move forward. I, I tried to do it in the best biblical way that I knew how to do. Um, their response was not a biblical or humble response. They started telling other people, um, kind of turning the situation to, to, to make it not what it was. And, and just out of the clear blue, I was on my way to work. And God told me, call this person and talk to him. Mm -hmm. I was like, why, God? 
call him. So I did. I got to work. I called him. I said, hey, uh, just kind of want to, uh, you know, I, normally I never, ever, ever respond. But this one time I did. Sure enough, um, it was a dear friend. And they had heard the claim. They were upset. They were fixing to roll. And so when I sat down with them and, and started to talk about the context and give them the, the, the behind the scenes picture, it, it restored that relationship. It deepened our relationship. That, that, that What I believe is that it saved what could have been unimaginably bad. Right. So most often you don't respond, but sometimes you need to respond carefully so that you can give context, offer an explanation, not an excuse, but, but to, to, to give a deeper inset of what's going on. Right. Maybe someone's criticizing you for going back to school. Right? You're going to go back to school. Oh my God, that's going to cost money, man. You got a job. You got kids. It's going to be it's going to wreck your schedule. Yeah. But when I get this degree, here's the plan. Right. It may it might be a financial decision. It might be a better position at work. I mean, you know why you're doing what you're doing. If it's thought out and prayed over and you know what you're calling, then then, then when someone criticizes, you can give context on why you're doing what you're doing. Maybe you're going to go into ministry. What? I mean, that that's crazy. Or here. Here's one. You're going to stay at home with your kids. Shouldn't you be working? You're going to quit work. And uh, or. You're going to go to work and not stay home with your kids? I mean, right? It's a no-win situation, isn't it, ladies? You're going to get criticized either way. But depending on the context, it might be, you know what? Yeah, I, I do need to leave my job because it's going to save us money in child care, gas, all the other things that goes along with working. You know, it might be better for you to stay home. You might have to make some financial decisions. And if you're okay with that and that's what you're planned out for, for your life, then, then, then you, you don't have to answer to anybody. Just give them the context. You know what? It's going to be better for our marriage. It's going to be better for our kids. Or maybe, you know what? It's going to be better to get our kids plugged into a program of some kind so they're not running amok all day long. This is going to give them some structure and I can go make some money. I mean, I don't know the context for you. But when, when others criticize, they might not know the full picture. Does that make, is it, you following me in this? Yep. So you offer an explanation, not an excuse, right? So when your friends unleash on you for no reason, when a coworker picks you apart, or when your parents are riding you, wait before you respond. Here, this is... The, I don't know much about Twitter. I have an account, but I, I don't think I've ever even t t t tweeted anything. <laughs> I kind of feel dirty just saying that. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is tweetable, I think. When emotions are high, wisdom is low. Oh. <laughs> right? When our emotions run high and we get into this, uh. our wisdom drops off here I'm not a big proponent of this either um, hashtag don't hit send no. right you need to write it write it out write it out but don't hit send if you need to kind of speak it say it wait until you've had a chance to mull it over think it through and then maybe you need to respond Maybe you don't, but your response always needs to bring clarity and it always needs to bring reconciliation. Yes. If what you're fixing to send or what you're fixing to post, what you're fixing to say isn't going to do those two things, bring clarity or reconciliation, don't say it because it's not going to do any good. It's only going to escalate and it, the emotions will begin to rise and our wisdom begins to lower. Right? Just hashtag don't hit send. There. Okay. I've been cool for the day. Right? So, oftentimes, this is something else. Oftentimes, criticism isn't about you. 
Most angry people are usually hurting people. Most people that are critical are critical because they're hurting or because they have a past hurt, because they're um, angry in some way. Here, I've never met a well-adjusted, happy, productive, positive person who constantly puts hateful comments on Facebook. I just don't. I don't know anybody that's joy-filled, following Jesus, happy, um, deal with people well, that are out there saying horrible things, right? It's those people that are hurting, that are angry, that are critical, that are the ones that are out there um, just, just saying these things. They're hurting people. Critical people are critical because of something, not because of you, but because of something in them. And so here, our response before we say anything should be compassion. Amen. They're saying and doing something hateful or you know, like that to me because of something they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Right, to go back to the issue that I was talking about, the, the, the folks, because of sin in their life, they were slinging mud and attacking me like I had done something wrong. I was this horrible guy getting in the big middle of their business. But I was trying to restore their home. I was trying to restore their marriage. I was trying to restore their ministry. And in so doing, you know, I had to realize that I needed to offer compassion because they were fixing to go headlong into a train wreck. And I couldn't stop it. Right? Um... When we back up and prayerfully respond wisely, knowing that it should be from a place of compassion that would offer context and reconciliation. So all this making sense? I know this is, to me, it seems like it's pretty deep, but it's just so important, right? So oftentimes we don't respond. Sometimes we respond carefully. Number three is occasionally... You listen and you make a change. Right? Sometimes the critics are right. Right? When everyone is telling you that there is a problem, there may be a problem. Right? When, when your spouse is constantly telling you this and other people say, yeah, she's right, or yes, he's right, you might want to listen. Right? If everyone keeps telling you you're dating Satan, you might want to cast the demon out. <laughs> you follow me? Right? Sometimes the critics are right. In Proverbs 15, 31 and 32, um, and, and this is a treat, y'all. I'm going to use the New Living Translation. I almost never, ever do, but here's what it says. It says, if you listen to constructive criticism, you will be at home among the wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. Amen. Right? Constructive criticism helps. And so sometimes your critics, and even, even the harshest of critics um, that's just sometimes attack, there can be truth grounded in it. So we always need to mull it over. We always need to think it through. But sometimes we need to listen and make a change. Right? When I first started, um, when we first started the church and I first started preaching, I had never done anything like that. And so um, after a while, you know, I'd always ask for Peggy's input. And so uh, that, that was in the beginning. I don't much care for her input anymore. But, you know. <laughs> But back then, she was struggling to give it. Now she gives it freely. <laughs> but I can remember she was like, listen, Hank, I, I love you, and everyone loves you, um, but there's just some things that, you know, um, everybody kind of talks about it, and I've noticed it, and, um, we, you know, she was real timid. She didn't want to say it. She goes, but um, just what you do with your hands, you're, you're always walking around like this, right? Like you're carrying a box. <laughs> so over the years I've tried to put the box down, right? <laughs> Try to think of the other things. So now there's, there's the throwing, right? I throw this way or I throw that way, 
Um, there's all kinds of things that I try to do. Now I'm going to be mindful of the rest of the thing. But, but along the way, there are things I've said, some habits that I've gotten into. Um, you, you know, uh, 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 you know, you know, you know, I say you know all the time. You follow me, right? I mean, because listen, I'm not totally convinced you people are listening to me. <laughs> Anyhow. We always have to listen to the criticism, right? Because there's always some truth grounded in it. And we need to respond to that, right? Or we, we need to respond as in make a change. We need to see what it is that they're trying to get at. Um, and, and so uh, when it comes to certain things, right? When it, whatever that is, if there's someone um, who, who's talking about your, your parenting or talking about your marriage or talking about just whatever it is that... You, that and you continue to see this pattern of people coming and, and saying this, you, you might want to address that. Um, I, mean, I can only think of a couple of times in the last week that I've needed to listen to criticism and make a change, right? So it doesn't happen that often. Anyway, right? You follow me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so sometimes... We need to listen. Occasionally, we need to listen and make a change. Number four, always. Say that with me. Always. always. So we have an often, we have a sometimes, we have an occasionally, and we have a always. always. So um, here, ready? Say this. Often, we don't respond. <laughs> sometimes, we respond carefully. Occasionally, we listen and make a change, and always guard your heart, right? Always work to guard your heart. Here, when we talk about critical people, a lot of times, what's your first thought? Those critical people, right? Sometimes we need to talk about this critical person. Right? And when I say this critical person, you need to point to yourself, not me. Right? That's what I'm getting at. We can tend to be critical. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. Or uh, other translations would say stabbing or cutting. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. See, we need to be saying things that would restore and heal rather than criticize and cut. Yes. So we need to guard our own hearts against this critical spirit because we can tend to be critical. I, I meet with a guy um, pretty regular and uh, he and I both, we talk about it all the time. We pray about it all the time because both of us tend to have a very critical spirit. Listen, when I sit down with a group of people from a leadership perspective, I can tell you the 15 things almost immediately that you're doing wrong, right? If I could preach a sermon on how 10 ways y'all are stupid that people would get saved, I would do it, right? I have a critical nature, and so do you. We tend to judge. Here, it's called sin. And we all have sin. And whatever it is, that sinful nature that's in us, we tend to be overly critical towards other people. Right? They're not doing what we do. Or they do the things we don't do. I mean, right? And so, whatever it is, we're right, they're wrong, and I'm critical toward that fact. Right? Can you believe the way that she dresses? Oh my gosh, she wore that to church. Um, my boss is an idiot. Right? Here. They need to fire that coach. Never mind the fact that 8th grade B team was the most football I ever played, but I know they should fire that coach. <laughs> right? Am I right? Right? We tend to be critical. Football season is the worst for me. If I had that money, uh, trust me, I wouldn't spend it that way. So they, she doesn't have any idea how dumb they look. <laughs> she is so full of her selfie, selfie, selfie. <laughs> I, 
I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely embarrassed now. <laughs> hey, I'm just being honest, right? Here, here's what we do in the South. Yeah, God love them. God love them, but, right? And that makes it all okay. Then we can just slam them with whatever, whatever we want to. Oh, God loves them, right? So you follow me, right? Because we can have a critical spirit, we need to guard our hearts. We need to be mindful of how we're attacking others. What our judgmental position is at times. Right? Here. And just saying, well, I tend to be opinionated. That's not any better. It sounds better, but it's not. Right? Right? We have a better opinion of how they should spend their money. We have a better opinion of how they should lead. We have a better opinion of how whatever it is, right? Their work ethic. And I get opinionated. There are certain things that just drive me insane. How you approach that. And, and so listen, I'm not saying that we never say anything. If there's an issue we need to address, we need to do it in a loving way. Right, we need to speak life into people, especially with our kids, especially with our friends, um, and even co workers. Even, uh, uh, right, uh, when we speak life into people, we address the very same issues. We might see something that, that, that we recognize that if they were to do differently or make a change, or we may even see sin in someone's life, but how we address it changes the outcome always. Right? When you have a better way or, or, or you've been down that road, I've, I've got some wisdom here. Let me share that wisdom with you. Right? Here, example. I had probably one of the greatest, not the greatest, but a great conversation with one of my kids the other day. We were talking about money. And my typical fashion is to just jump all over them how they're spending their money, right? It's just what I do, right? But it was a good conversation on thinking ahead when it comes to investing, right? Go ahead and put into your retirement now the percentage wise before you ever even see it that way it's just put away and then 10 years from now you're gonna have this pretty good chunk of money you didn't even realize you, you don't make it now and so when you begin to make it you immediately invest it then you still don't miss it. you don't you don't miss it because you don't see it now you, you'll never miss it right if you just take that step now just just make that step you, you're gonna be amazed at what it'll do for you and but it was better than well, you just keep doing that, right? I mean, I could have just wiped out the whole ability or the insight to give them something. Now, they may go ahead and say, whatever, Dad, you're stupid, which I get it. But at least how we approached the conversation was, was way better. Is that, you get me? Okay, so my critical spirit is most often born out of pride, ignorance, or hurt. Pride because I think I know better. Ignorance because I don't know the full story. Or hurt because I've had someone attack me and I'm just retaliating on someone else. And that's true for you as well. Guard your heart, right? Um, to overcome a critical spirit, we have to not be overly sensitive to criticism. When you know your calling, it clarifies your direction and you don't need to worry about someone criticizing it because you're not answering to man, you're only answering to God, God right? Um, when we're grounded deeply in Christ, criticism doesn't matter. Because who I am in Jesus matters more than what anyone else thinks. And that's true for you. Ready? Say it with me. Who I am in Jesus matters more than what others think. I know that's a lot. 
but I want you to say that. I want that to be something that you wake up and spend time with Jesus, read, pray, and just understand that day that who you are in Christ matters more than what someone else thinks. It doesn't matter if someone criticizes what you do. It doesn't matter if someone criticizes these things. What you do and who you are in Christ is more important than everything else. And when we let people attack us and we take it harshly and we turn it around and begin to get prideful and arrogant, maybe defending ourselves in some way, then we end up being the exact same way. Guard your heart. Um, this is a quote from Billy Graham. He said, I'm not moved by praise from pan fans or criticism from haters. He just knew what he was to do in Christ. The praise was good, but that's not what motivated him. The criticism was harsh, but that never stopped him. You can't let compliments go to your head and you can't let criticism go to your heart. Here, Romans 14, 10 through 13 says this. <clears throat> Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For you will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. <clears throat> so then each of us will give an account of God or of himself to God. Listen. Regardless of what criticism you give others, you're going to stand before God and only answer for you. It says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. There is enough negativity in the world. There is enough criticism. There is enough hateful Speech. There's enough negative people out there. Heavens to Betsy, just scroll through YouTube for two seconds and just see the political landscape. See the, the, the divide in people, the, the negativity and the criticism and the judgment. There is enough of it out there. We don't need to be a part of it. We need to be wholly separated from it. Walk in Jesus. Know your calling. Oftentimes, we don't respond to criticism. Sometimes, we respond carefully. Occasionally, we need to listen to it and make changes, but always, always, always guard your heart against critical spirit. We're to bring life into relationships. Be the one who's always seeing the good or believing the best, or walking in faith, or seeking joy in all things to speak life into those around you. Amen. And when they criticize you for it, sometimes you don't need to respond. Often you don't need to respond. But when you do, think it through. And if you've thought it through and there's something truth about it that you need to change, make that change. Respond to the Holy Spirit, but always guard your heart so that we don't become critical as well. My hope and prayer for this church and for, for us is that we would allow critical people to say whatever it is that they're going to say. Pass over that. Forgive them in the moment. Mull it over and respond rightly, whether that's to or not to respond. And if we respond, bring context and clarity so that they would see their criticism was unwarranted so that they would have the opportunity to repent. Because it's them seeing Jesus in you that will reveal Jesus to them. Right. Amen? Amen? Let me pray for us. Father God, I pray that just as we all deal with critical people, we know that Jesus 
dealt with critical people. And so, Father, as we just study on our own and we read Scripture on our own and as we pray on our own, I pray that you would just reveal those truths, reveal those moments, reveal those times where Jesus either didn't respond and when he did, it was rightly, and how we're to pull from that. How we're to respond in the same way Jesus did. I pray, Father, that those that are dealing with a critical relationship that, that, that's just hurt-filled and, and attacking, it's those things that you just takes the life out of you at times. Father, I pray that you would give them encouragement this morning. I pray that you would um, just give them a new heart, a new set, a new position that's, that they know who they are in you that they know their calling. And that criticism is not against them. It's not about them. That they wouldn't respond harshly, that they would, that, that they would respond with compassion because it's the hurt and anger in others that, that, that would cause them to attack us. And so I pray that we would just have this compassion for others, that we would speak life into them, and then our response would be grounded in who we are in Jesus. And so Jesus, I invite you into our hearts to take control. Allow the Holy Spirit to take control of us so that we could guard our hearts against criticism, that we could guard our hearts against a critical spirit so that we wouldn't be critical to others. And I pray that we would not be the judge that we would let you judge. And we would just bring the same love and compassion and life that you brought us. We love you, Jesus. Father, we love you. We worship you. We close out our time in singing to you. I pray that as we close out our time, we would just be encouraged to sing out, to pray, whatever it is that you would have us do to respond to this message and to your worship. I love you. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.